Okay, hello everyone. Thanks very much for your patience as we worked out some uh, glitches today. Um, I think that you all know that I'm Melanie, the admin assistant for the association. Sal is not here today. He's having uh, some computer problems and I have to run because I'm actually, I'm leading a tour in Italy and I have to go back to work. We have a, a group dinner. Uh, so I have to go meet my group. Um, so Jim is very kindly going to be your host for today. And our speaker is Steve Miller, who I think many of you know. We've been fortunate to have Steve speak with us before. Um, uh, mostly about is Steve, your your the intersection between your travels and your your extensive travels in Europe and your long interest in World War One. And so today you're expanding on that theme uh, in in honor of, of course, the recent Veterans Day and Remembrance Day celebrations with a presentation on America's Unknown Soldier. As always, this will be up on our YouTube site. Uh, I'll, ha I'll have this up for you um, by around Monday or Tuesday. And uh, thanks for everyone who sent in uh, donations. If you sent in something in in the past couple of days, I didn't get it because I'm in, if you sent a check that is, I'm in Italy, but I will uh, be, I uh, will be taking care of all that as soon as I get back and have been seeing all those who have sent in um, donations via <laughs> PayPal. So be processing those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we need where we are going to be working on upgrading the uh, the renewal interface. I know it needs a, it could use a refresh. So that is coming. And just a reminder that the most recent uh, issues of the here and there newsletter and World War One Illustrated, those were the last ones for the for the member year ending in 2022. Remember the, year, the member year has just ended this week and the new member year is starting. And so please do renew. If you're not sure about your status, just email me. I'll put my, I'll put our address in the chat. And um, I, you know, I, I am traveling right now, but I do have access to email and checking it regularly and we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Just going to put this in for you. Um, okay, so that's our address. We do have a speaker uh, for lined up already for December. We'll be sending information out about that soon for the last meeting of 2022. And again, thank you so much, Jim, for stepping in today. Uh, thank you, Steve, for all your enthusiastic participation. I look forward to watching the recording. Uh, everyone enjoy the meeting and here is steve miller to talk about america's unknown soldier let me just cut in for a second oh, yeah. so um with melanie gone i'll be running the show and you know we'll pass it off to steve in a second but if you have any questions uh feel free to add them in the chat and then i'll be monitoring the questions when steve's done so you're up steve okay thank you and the observant among you will notice i used the 48 star flag which i thought was appropriate for my uh subject uh, just as the USA was late to the party in entering the war, there was little initial impetus to honor an unknown soldier. Although U.S. volunteers had fought under foreign flags, uh, oh boy, this is reversed, uh, U.S. forces had been in major combat for only about six months. The Army believed its grades registration service eventually would identify all the dead, and the USA lacked a comparable emotional site such as the Arc de Triomphe in Paris or Westminster Abbey in London. Nonetheless, Congressman Hamilton Fish III uh, of New York introduced a resolution calling for the return of an unknown soldier to be honored in a tomb before the Memorial Amphitheater at Arlington National Cemetery. Himself a veteran, Fish had been a New York National Guardsman with the 369th Infantry Division, the Harlem Hellfighters. His motion was assisted by the fact that there were still 1,237 AEF fatalities, which could not be identified. The bill was approved on 4 March 1921 as public resolution number 67 of the 66th Congress. President Wilson signed it as one of his last official acts in office. Secretary of War Week selected the third anniversary of the armistice as a ceremonial date and Congress declared 11 November 1921 a legal holiday so the nation could honor those who participated in the war. It was directed on 22 October 1921 
A casket was to be exhumed from each of four cemeteries representing the theaters where major American operations took place. Every American cemetery burial, including the unknowns, had a registration card identifying the specific location and other details. Lieutenant Colonel Quackenbush had selected two cards at random for each of the four cemeteries, providing an alternate in the event some means of identification might be found in the primary. He appointed an officer to, to, for each of the cemeteries to oversee the exhumation process. On the 22nd, the officers performed the gruesome task of examining each casualty's body and clothing to verify there were no unique features by which he might be later identified, as well as sifting through the earth beneath the coffin for any items such as dog tags, religious objects, photographs, etc. The blanket was then, uh, the body was then wrapped in a blanket, covered in a sheet, and placed in a new coffin. Care was to be made not to make any identifiable markings on the coffin or the enclosed new shipping case. On the 23rd of October, 1921, four identical trucks carrying the shipping cases drove to Chalande en Marne, today known as Chalande en Champagne, Hotel de Ville, the city hall. The city hall is fairly easy to find up here at 11 o'clock is the uh, rail, rail yard and train station. This bridge running northeast southwest crosses the Marne River and the Hotel de Ville is right up at, right there, easy to find. Can't miss it. Want, okay, uh, just a minute, I lost my place. I may, let me repeat this if I, if I did. Okay, 23 October. I got the four trucks, all right. Their arrival at the Hotel de Ville was precisely timed to a 10 minute window to assist the anonymity of the origins of each shipping case. Eight French NCOs carried the cases from the trucks past the French honor guard into the Hotel de Ville where they arranged randomly. The shipping cases were inverted to serve as beers and American flags covered the coffins. A French honor guard took positions and for the next two hours, French citizens, including many war widows, paid their respects to the four unknowns inside the Hotel de Ville. Later that evening, the French soldiers rearranged the four coffins. The room was cleared and two American embalmers who had never observed the uh, bodies previously shifted the remains between coffins. Uh, these guys would make great for the Federal Witness Protection Program. The activities ensured the unknowns were unknown but to God, as neither their identity nor cemetery of origin now could be ascertained. Major Robert, Major Robert P. Harbold, the quartermaster officer in charge, had chosen Sergeant Edward F. Younger of Headquarters Company, 2nd Battalion, 50th Infantry, American Forces in Germany, to select the coffin. At 11 a.m. on the 24th, that's the time of the armistice, Younger circled the coffins three times before placing a white rose on one to designate his selection and salute it. The rose would accompany the casket to the United States and be interred with the selectee. The selectee was placed in a new ebony casket inlaid with silver. The casket bore the inscription, unknown but to God. For the next few hours, French citizens again paid homage to the selectee, many offering prayers and leaving flowers. At 5 p.m., a caisson drawn by four black horses drew up before the steps. Eight U.S. soldiers carried the casket out to the caisson, and they began a slow procession to the train station. Officers mounted on horseback led the way, followed by a military band and the French infantry from the Guard of Honor. Last came the caisson bearing the unknown soldier. After speeches and memorial services, a special train departed Chalons on Marne with the casket. Following an overnight stop in Paris, the train resumed its journey to Le Havre, arriving on the 25th to meet the USS Olympia for the transatlantic voyage. The Olympia had a distinguished record uh, served as Commodore Dewey's uh, flagship in 1898, the Battle of Manila Bay, and fired the opening shot for our participation in the Spanish-American War. In 1917, 
It patrolled American coast and escorted transports. 1918 saw it transporting uh, doughboys to North Russia to fight the Bolsheviks after the Russian Revolution and provided humanitarian aid for the Spanish flu in 1918. Okay. Uh, oops, I'm. Okay, I was. All right. Uh, okay, excuse me, I've just lost my place here again. All right, at La Havre, additional ceremonies were held, including the award of the highest French Order of Merit, the Order de la Légion de Honor by French Minister of Pensions, Andre Maginot. That's the Maginot of Verdun and major and later Maginot line fame. The Olympia flew both American and French flags at half mast, accompanied by the French and American national anthems, along with Chopin's funeral march, the casket was transferred aboard the Olympia. Departing that afternoon, the Olympia was escorted by the American destroyer Reuben James, and yes, that's the Reuben James of folk song fame, and seven French vessels. A French battleship fired a 17-gun salute as she cleared the harbor, and another as the French ships parted company just outside French territorial waters. The protective shipping container for the unknown was too large for internal storage aboard the Olympia, so it was secured to a hatch for the voyage. A 24-hour Marine Guard was assigned. Near disaster struck when remnants of two hurricanes buffered the ship with 20 to 30 foot waves for 10 of the 15 days voyage, threatening to capsize the Olympia. The Marine Guards lashed themselves to a stanchion to avoid being washed overboard. Luck was with the Olympia, however, and the ship and its precious cargo sailed into the Washington Navy Yard on a rainy November 9th. Passing Fort Washington and the Washington Barracks, the Olympia received a 21-gun salute and another upon arrival at the Navy Yard. The Marines and sailors from the ship's company carried the casket to the quarterdeck while the ship's band played Chopin's funeral march. The bosun swiped the unknown soldier uh, the bosun piped the unknown soldier ashore where he's met by the dignitaries. Um, I don't know if you can see him over on the far right, but uh, there's Weeks, Denby, Pershing, and Lejeune. Once ashore, the, sh the ship's band rendered four flourishes, a dignity accorded a four-star flag officer, and played the national anthem. Eight army body bearers of the 3rd Cavalry took the casket and placed it upon a flag draped caisson. The cavalry band played onward Christian soldiers as the procession moved toward the capital rotunda where the unknown was placed upon the Lincoln catafalque. President and Mrs. Warren Harding entered the rotunda and Mrs. Harding placed the white band of ribbon which she had made herself on the casket. Next, President Harding placed a silver national shield with 48 gold stars to the ribbon and then placed a wreath of crimson roses upon the casket. Pershing added a wreath and saluted. An honor guard was assigned to watch the casket overnight. On November 10th, the rotunda was open to the public. Thousands had paid their respects when it closed at midnight, turning away many others. At 8 a.m. on November 11th, the body bearers carried the coffin from the Capitol and placed it upon a caisson drawn by six black horses. The procession to Arlington Cemetery began. Uh, this is the parade route, Capitol being right here up to the White House and over to the Francis Scott Key Memorial Bridge. Those of us who know DC, will recognize that the Lincoln, uh, I'm sorry, the Arlington Memorial Bridge is not there. It was had not yet been constructed. This added several miles to the trip and I can uh, came to the conclusion it was roughly eight miles, quite a long procession. And here's some pictures from it. Woodrow Wilson, uh, crippled by a stroke, was unable to walk or climb steps, so he rode in a carriage so that he could honor the man he had sent to die.
At Arlington's National Memorial Amphitheater, the Marine Band opened the ceremony with the national anthem, followed by an invocation delivered by Colonel John T. Axton, the Army Chief of Chaplains. A bugler sounded attention and the assemblage observed a two minute period of silence. Next, the audience sang America, accompanied by the band. President Harding delivered an address honoring the unknown soldier and pleading for an end to war. The president placed a Medal of Honor and a Distinguished Service Cross upon the casket. High ranking foreign, high foreign dignitaries honored the unknown with various supreme awards, some of which had never been given to a foreigner. The casket was carried to the terrace and entombed in a simple crypt, the bottom of which was, was covered with earth from France. Bishop Rental read the memorial services and Congressman Fish laid the first of additional wreaths at the tomb. The tomb was lowered. The, uh, the saluting battery fired three volleys as the casket was lowered. The bugler sounded taps and a 21 gun salute concluded the ceremony. The original tomb was only a modest pedestal base and in 1926, architect Lorimer Rich designed a more elaborate and suitable monument. A 50-ton piece of Colorado marble was placed upon the tomb and sculpted to its present state by Thomas Hudson Jones. The project was completed on 31 December and 1931. Facing the cemetery burials are three figures representing peace, victory, and valor. Facing the amphitheater is the phrase, here rests in honor, glory, an American soldier known but to God. The same phrase etched on gravestones of unknown soldiers buried in American cemeteries throughout the world. Later, unknown soldiers from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam would join the first occupant. Subsequently, the unknown from Vietnam, First Lieutenant Michael J. Blasey, USAF, was identified, removed, and buried elsewhere by his family. You'll notice these three white rectangles in front of the stone sarcophagus. The two outer ones are World War II and Korea. I don't know which one is which. This was the Vietnam. There is some inscription on there. I don't know what it reads. I've been unable to locate that information. That one is still empty, uh, reserved possibly for future use. Uh, initially, the tomb was guarded by a civilian watchman. In 1926, a military guard was established during daylight hours when the public was allowed access to the cemetery. A 24-hour military guard was established in 1937. And on 6 April 1948, the 35th anniversary of the U.S. declaration of war, the 3rd United States Army Infantry, the Old Guard, became the full-time guardians. The Memorial Amphitheater serves as a museum holding artifacts related to the Tomb of the Unknown. Uh, I'll read this uh, inscription on the right. This flag draped the casket of the unknown soldier of World War I throughout the ceremonies in his honor in the nation's capital in Arlington National Cemetery from November 9th to November 11th, 1921. And here are some of his medals. And those are the foreign wards. And over on the far right is the one that Maginot uh, gave. Three unknowns who were not selected by Younger were re reinterred at uh, Romagni, given new ID numbers. And they're still very unknown. I don't remember what year I went to Chalon on Champagne, but uh, inside I did find over on the right here, this display, entirely in French. The Olympia now belongs to the Indianapolis Independent Seaport Museum. And uh, my 1993 visit, there was a shipping case. As I came to find out later, it was not the original. That was a disappointment. And one of the uh, signboards read, uh, what you see over on the left of the screen, I'll give you a minute to read that.
Okay, in correspondence with the uh, museum, the shipping case is now gone. They've added a, uh, the white roses and American flag and a lower signboard down on the right, which reads what's on your screen now. The Independent Seaport Museum is easy to find. It's uh, right across the river from downtown exotic Camden, New Jersey, uh, right near the intersections of I-676 and I-95. Uh, if you have a chance, do make that visit. It's well worth it. And finally, Sergeant Younger was died on 6 August 1942 and is buried in Arlington section 18, which is Muse Argon, and check the significance of the gravesite number. Very appropriate. Uh, I got a lot of this information from the Independent Seaport Museum and the Third Guard, uh, I'm sorry, Old Guard Museum, the two shown on the left, and the two books on the right. Uh, did find some contradictions among these sources. I've just made the best of what I found and hope it's accurate. And I want to uh, thank my friend Don Jay for suggesting looking for YouTube videos. I did find three. And if you do a YouTube search on uh, Unknown so Soldier World War I, you'll pick these up. The quality varies from really poor to fairly good. That concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to stop uh, screen sharing now. Jim, you want to take it? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Jim. So just let me cut in for a little bit. People know that I've written on World War I. Just a bit of a tidbit. The World War I cemetery at uh, Ramon Sur Mews is the largest US overseas military cemetery in the world outside of the one in the uh, Philippines. So it's even larger than the one in Omaha Beach. And I don't know if any, any of you have been to any World War I graveyards, uh, particularly the British, you could start walking through the, the gravestones and about one out of every three British soldier known under, you know, known only to God, Australian soldier known on, only to God. Um, it's, it's very moving. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to chime in, uh, feel free. Really a question for you, Steve. Do you have any idea uh, how it was selected in World War II? Because we had uh, you know, two operations of theater. And I don't know if what they pick one from Europe, one from the Pacific theater. Yes, uh, I, have, I really did not. I stumbled across that information solely by accident. But they did pick one from each theater. And I don't know how the final selection was made. I had enough trouble researching the First World War. Yeah. And as you point out, Jim, walking yeah. through those British cemeteries or actually driving around the Somme and the Ypres Salient is totally depressing. Cemetery after cemetery after cemetery. We were, as, as mentioned, we were only in combat about six months. So we suffered nowhere near the losses of the British and the French and the Germans. <clears throat> well, you know, American deaths in World War I were about 116 thousand, which actually are more than all of the deaths from the Korean War on. It's very close, 116, 114. Uh, British deaths were about 900,000. French were something 1.2 million. Germany were a couple million. Uh, actually, the largest number of casualties were in the Russians because of casualties in terms of things. But by the way, I don't know this. Does Australia have its own Unknown soldier? Uh, yes, they did. I forgot the name of the cemetery. I've been there. I photographed its gravesite. He was transported to Australia. I do, I do have pictures of the empty gravesite, but I'd have to dig for it. That's in Canberra, Steve? I think so. I've never been to Australia. OK, well, does anybody else have any other questions? 
Well, really on that note then, uh, one, I wanna thank you, Steve, for you know volunteering to do this. I thought it was very interesting. The you know, memorial at Arlington is very, very moving. And I know how they select the soldiers to guard it uh, is a very, very important thing. And the soldiers really revere the, their role doing it. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very special thing I think America has. And, you know, God bless America for doing that. Uh, Melanie has already suggested there, there will be a speaker in December. I think it's probably going to be December 10th, but she will give you all that information. So other than that, I want to thank everybody for attending. I wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving. Go well, go safe, go happy. And on that note, unless there's anything else, I'm going to stop the recording. And